Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> Kraft Cheese Company, makers of parquet margin and a complete line of famous quality food products, presents Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve. Kraft brings you the Great Gildersleeve every week at this time, written by John Whedon and Sam Moore with music by Claude Sweeten. We'll hear from the Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. One of those Lent and Time foods we like to welcome back are hot cross buns. In our house, we take them hot out of the oven, and so as that white crisscross icing trickles over the golden brown crust, we like to break the buns open and spread on plenty of delicious parquet margarine. Oh, man, do they ever taste good spread with parquet. Yes, buns, biscuits, bread and rolls all taste extra good when you spread on parquet margarine. The flavor is so fresh, so delicate, so satisfying. And remember, parquet adds extra nourishment to your Lenten meals. Parquet is one of the finest of energy foods. And it's fortified by Kraft, you know, so that every pound contains 9,000 units of vitamin A. So buy Parquet, the nourishing spread that tastes so good. P-A-R-K-A-Y, Parquet Margarine, made by Kraft. Yes, Kraft makes Parquet. Now let's join the great Gildersleeve, who's been practically a new man since his sister-in-law, Aunt Hattie, left Summerfield. We find him now occupying his official chair as the town's water commissioner near the end of the best day's work he's done in some time. Well, come on, Bessie. Give me more letters to answer, more complaints to handle, more worlds to conquer. Mr. Gildersleeve, I don't think there are any more. Now, Bessie, when I'm in the mood for work, you better take advantage of it. Yes, sir. I never saw you like this before. Would you feel like signing a few checks for the March bill? Bring them on, Bessie. At the end of the day, the water department will owe no man a penny. Oh, give me bills, lots of bills, neat the starry skies above. Mr. Gildersleeve, I just don't understand you today. Well, there's nothing mysterious about me, Bessie. <laughs> Haven't you ever talked to a fellow who just got out of jail? Oh, I should say not. I don't associate with those kind of people. Yeah, I beg your pardon, Bessie. I was merely using a figure of speech. What I meant was I just got out of jail myself. I'm a canary. I just got out of my cage. I'm a goldfish, and I sneaked out of my bowl. When a goldfish gets out of his bowl, he dies in about ten minutes. I know, Bessie. We had one once. He jumped out of his bowl and landed inside the piano. Then he passed away. I see. We didn't find him for several days. It made it awfully hard to play the piano. <laughs> Must have made it hard to stay in the house. What I was trying to explain, Bessie, is that I feel very free today. You know, full of energy, vitality, and beams. Okay. <laughs> Here are the bills. Isn't that funny? All of a sudden, I don't feel like working anymore. I feel like playing. Come on, Bessie, let's play, huh? <laughs> Mr. Gildersleeve, we can't play. This is an office. I don't care. Let's play anyway. Play what? Oh, anything. Ring around the rosy, drop the handkerchief, musical chairs... Post office? <laughs> I know what's the matter with you, Mr. Gildersleeve. You've got spring fever. Hi, <laughs> yeah. uh, George. I wonder if that's it. Well, whatever it is, I've done a lot of work today, and I'm not going to do any more. Come on, Bessie. Let's dance. Oh, well, there's no music. Oh, we'll make our own music. Oh, give me music, give me music, neat the starry skies above. Woo! Come dance with me. Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve. Here comes somebody. What? Yes. Oh, <laughs> Uncle Mars, what on earth are you doing? Well, well, if it isn't my favorite niece. The prettiest flower in Summerfield. You know Marjorie, don't you, Bessie? Oh, yes. Hello, Marjorie. Hello, Bessie. I just dropped in hoping I could chisel a ride home, Uncle Mars. But I can wait if you're busy. <laughs> yes. By a curious coincidence, my dear, I just decided not to do another stroke of work today. Well, I'd been doing a little shopping, and I just thought maybe I wouldn't have to carry all these packages home. Quite right, my dear. Uh, you hatchuary? Mm -hmm. Isn't it darling? Oh, it's beautiful. Say, it does something for you, my dear. Makes you look grown up. By George, without outfits, you ought to go places. I hope some darn boy will think so, too. I get so sick of waiting for them, don't you? Absolutely disgusted. But what else is there to go out with? Uh, well, <laughs> I'll tell you what we'll do, Marjorie. You and I will go out and paint the town tonight. What do you say? Oh, Uncle, do you mean it? Of course I mean it. You think you'd like to step out with your old uncle? Oh, you're not old. I'll bet a middle-aged woman would think you were fascinating. Never mind the middle-aged women. <laughs> 
What do you think? I think you're Prince Charming. That's the girl. All right, my dear, we'll make Whoopi tonight. We'll go to every lively spot in town. After that, we'll rush around and wake up a few of the dead ones. We'll make a night of it. Till 11.30. <laughs> Where does all this traffic come from? Everybody's hurrying home to dinner, I guess. Red line, Uncle Mort. Oh, didn't see it. <laughs> you coming over here? No, but you better back up. You're in the crosswalk. I don't know why they have to change these lights so suddenly. Anything behind me? <laughs> oh, all right, all right. You saw I was backing. Why don't you learn to drive, brother? <laughs> Where's that cop, Marjorie? Look, isn't that Charlie Pettibone? Charlie who? Where? It is. It's Charlie Pettibone. Blow your horn at him. Here. Don't do that, Marjorie. I'm in bad with a cop already. Charlie! Hey, Charlie! I don't see any... He's Char- uniform there. He must be home on leave. Why, George, it is. Hello, Charlie. Remember me, Mr. Gildersleeve? Oh, of course. Hello. How are you? It sure is. Oh. Well, I see you remember little Marjorie, don't you? <laughs> you bet. Only the last time I saw her... Well, I didn't realize I'd been away so long. You look fine, Charlie. <laughs> so do you. <laughs> well, how does it seem to get back to the old hometown, eh? Oh, great. Great. Are you home for long? Two weeks. Hope I'll see you around. The light's changed, Uncle Morris. Oh, yeah. Well, come and see us, Charlie. Regards to your father and mother. Oh, by the way, Marge, what are you doing tonight? What? Goodbye, Charlie. We should have offered him a ride, Uncle Morris. You haven't forgotten you have a date with your old uncle, I hope. Charlie looks wonderful in this uniform, doesn't he? Yes, he does. (laughs) Nice boy, Charlie. Nice boy. Did you see all the ribbons he had? Yeah, he must have seen plenty of action, all right. Can't be much more than 19, either. It's only a difference of three years. What do you mean? Look out, red light! (laughs) How do I keep missing him? You just barely missed that woman. Why don't they look... It's Eve! It's Miss Goodwin! Eve! Oh, hello, Throckmorton. Come on, climb in. I'll take you where you're going. Open the door, Marjorie. Well, that's awfully nice of you. Hello, Marjorie. Hello, Miss Goodwin. I'll climb in back. Hop in, Eve. Where are you going? <sighs> I was on my way home. Take you right there. You're sure it won't be out of your way? <laughs> Nonsense. I'd go out of my way for you any time. <laughs> oh, you're very sweet. You know, we haven't seen each other in a long time, Eve. We ought to do something about that. Well, I've been busy. School and now the Red Cross drive. Well, I've been busy, too, but never too busy to say hello. Hello, Eve. Yeah. <laughs> oh, watch it. Uncle Mort. Oh. You went right through that one. Well, it's too late to stop. <laughs> Uncle Mort, why don't you let me drive? I've told you, my dear, you're too young to drive. Well, somebody ought to be driving. <laughs> <laughs> dear, dear. Now, don't worry. I've never had an accident. That was my fault. <laughs> See, there's Floyd Munson. Hi, Floyd. You hold on to the wheel, Unky. I'll do the waving. Hi, George. The town is full of people today. You saw young Charlie Pettibone a little ways back. Oh, really? I knew he was in town. I, um, uh, I've been seeing a good deal of his mother lately. Oh? Yes, the woman's club has been helping in the Red Cross Drive, and she's president, of course. A president of the woman's club. You might think she was president of the Red Cross, too. Yeah, I've always found her a little difficult myself. Difficult? <laughs> but then they're all difficult. Oh, here it is, Throckmorton. Huh? Oh, yes. <laughs> Been so long since I, well, almost went by it. <laughs> Wait a minute, Eve. What's your hurry? Well, here we are, and you must be anxious to get home. Not at all. Don't rush off. What about the, well, what I was saying before? We never seem to see each other anymore. I'm always happy to see you, Throckmorton. It's just that... Then how about tonight? Well, I'm not sure that oh, I'll... Oh, Lord. What about our evening? Oh, <laughs> Forgot you were back there, Marjorie. <laughs> Don't worry. I might go out with Charlie Pettibone. Good idea. Uh, how about tonight, Eve? Honestly, Throckmorton, I'm so busy with the Red Cross, I haven't any time. Oh. Of course, if I had a little help, you wouldn't like to give us a hand, would you? Sure. What's your problem, Eve? I'll clear it up in five minutes. Well, you see, Judge Hooker is chairman of the Red Cross Drive, but he's in Chicago, and he hasn't been able to get reservations back. Serves him right. So they've asked me to, uh, help out till he returns. Oh? Uh-huh. And I've been having a perfectly awful time, particularly with the women. To begin with, there's Mrs. Pettibone and her crowd. Yeah, I know them. What do you want me to do about it? Well, 
If you could take over the chairmanship... Oh, you, gosh, Eve. Oh, just till the judge gets back. You handle these things so easily. Oh, you think so? <laughs> you have a wonderful way with women, Throckmorton. Mm. <laughs> now, uh, Leela Ransom, for instance. Leela? What's she up to? Well, Leela and I are in very good terms, but she is being a little difficult. You just leave Leela to me. I thought if you could speak to her and sort of straighten her out... Don't worry, Eve. I mean, if you could just reason with her and... Well, you know the way. I know the way, but it has nothing to do with reason. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Throckmorton, Martin, this is such a relief. I know you'll make a wonderful chairman. You just watch that old thermometer on the city hall go up, Eve. All these women need is a little handling. And I'm just the man who can do it. <laughs> Oh, hello, Leela. Uh, come in. Hmm. Something smells wonderful. Spam. An old recipe of my grandmother Beecham's. <laughs> I hope you'll forgive my apron. Oh, it's pretty. Uh, got ruffles. Uh, I'd ask you to stay to dinner. Only... Oh, I couldn't. No, Bertie's got our dinner waiting. I just wanted to ask you something, Leela. Yes? What's this I hear about trouble between you and Eve over the Red Cross? Trouble? Oh, you must be mistaken, Throckmorton. Why, even I are the best of friends. Oh, maybe I got it wrong. I will admit, I think she's being a little bossy about the whole thing. You'd think she was running it. Well, isn't she? That's not the point. You... It isn't Eve anyway. It's that Mrs. Pettibone. I simply had to tell Eve, I said to her, my dear, much as I admire the Red Cross, and I do, Throckmorton, I think it's wonderful what they're doing for the soldiers, but I said to her, much as I admire it, I shall simply have to refuse to have anything more to do with the drive, as long as that woman is connected with it. Now, Leela, that's no attitude. Oh, let me tell you what she did first, and then if you don't agree that my attitude is perfectly justified, I'll never speak to you again. <laughs> Well, uh, uh, what did she do? Well, what didn't she do? Hogan Brothers let us use one of the windows in their store for a Red Cross display. And the idea was to have one of the ladies dress up in a Red Cross uniform and sit in the window rolling bandages. Good idea. Well, I was chosen to sit in the window. That was distinctly understood by Judge Hooker before he left town. In fact, he told me he chose me because the Red Cross uniform was so becoming to me. Well, it's becoming to any woman. That's a matter of opinion. <laughs> anyway, I was to sit in the window. I had my hair done specially and everything. Well, I went down to Hogan Brothers yesterday morning at 9 o'clock, and what do you think? There was Mrs. Pettibone in the window, sitting in my place, wearing my uniform and rolling my bandages. What do you think of that? Well, I don't know what to say. Uh, maybe Mrs. Pettibone is a better bandage roller. <sighs> Mrs. Pettibone is a butterfingers. Huh? Besides, it isn't as if I wanted to sit in the old window. I had a better idea, only nobody would listen to me. What was that? I wanted to raise money with a kissing booth. A what? A kissing booth. Oh, sounds interesting. Tell me more. You've never heard of a kissing booth? Yeah. Why, that's how we always raise money down home. You just have a booth with a pretty girl in it, and you charge a dollar a kiss. Sounds foolproof to me. <laughs> I'd be willing to put a little money in a thing like that myself. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Why, I remember one time down in Savannah, I was running a kissing booth for the Bidewee home, and George William Hungerford came round. He was terribly in love with me at the time, and his family was rich as sin. And do you know, he kissed a hundred dollars goodbye before he knew it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had to go to bed for two days, but the body we home got its steam table. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what you're up against in a town like this, Leela. People probably think kissing is a little undignified for the Red Cross. Why, for goodness sakes, I think it would be very good for morale. But who's going to get any thrill out of watching that pudgy Mrs. Pettibone sit in Hogan's window and fumble with bandages? Now, Leela, be fair. This is for a patriotic purpose. Well, gracious. I guess I'm just as patriotic as anybody. If you're implying that I'm I'm not, not implying anything, Leela. I just don't see how kisses are going to win the war. Oh, so you're siding with her. I'm not siding with anybody, Leela. I'm just asking you to be reasonable. Oh, now I'm unreasonable. Oh, I didn't say that, Leela, but I've been asked to act as chairman of this Oh, thing. you're the chairman. Well, let me tell you, Mr. Chairman, I don't want any part of anything that Mrs. Pettibone's connected with. 
Uh, but Leela. I'm sorry, Throckmorton. My supper's ready, and I'm sure yours is, too. How did I ever get into this? Greg Gildersleeve will be with us again in just a few seconds. Now a message from Kraft to the millions of American families who daily enjoy parquet margarine as a delicious spread for bread. Women tell us it's sometimes difficult these days to get parquet margarine at their favorite food store. And the simple explanation is this. Quality margarines are in bigger demand than ever before. Now that's especially true of spreads like parquet, the choice of millions because of its fine flavor, its long-established reputation for consistently fine quality. Kraft assures you that everything possible is being done to keep dealers supplied. All available parquet margarine is distributed fairly and equitably. So if you can't get parquet the first time, try again, won't you? The chances are your dealer soon will have a new supply on hand. Always look for, always ask for delicious, nourishing parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. Now let's get back to Summerfield and the great Gildersleeve. His second day as chairman of the Red Cross fundraising drive is only half over, but Gildersleeve's house is already buzzing with activity. I don't see how we can get any more chairs in the living room, Bertie. Mr. Gildersleeve, we ain't got any more chairs. Oh? Well, maybe Leroy could bring down that rocking chair from the attic. Leroy saw this coming, Mr. Gildersleeve. He skinned out of here right after breakfast. Oh, that darn kid. Well, let's see. Yes, I'll have to sit here as chairman, and there's room for three on the sofa. One here, two here, two here, and the four dining room chairs. That's 12. Then if we can... Answer that, will you, Bertie? I'll pull the piano bench around so somebody can sit on that. Yes, sir. Careful, it's one of these. I'm coming. Oh, my goodness, that's the doorbell, too. Which one should I answer? Uh, you answer the phone, and I'll get the door, Bertie. Yes, sir. Red Cross headquarters. No, sorry, Sonny. Leroy's not here. Who's calling, please? No, I don't know where he is. Just a minute. Mr. Gillsleeve, it's the water department. Are you home? Can't bother with water today, Bertie. Uh-oh, there goes the back door. Oh, for Leroy's basketball? I don't know. He must have taken it with him, Alvin. <laughs> now, you can't come in and wait. You got it. I'm sorry, but Mr. Gillsleeve's not at home. <laughs> Goodbye. I don't think she'd believe me. Yeah, I don't care. What the devil's at the back door? Uncle Moore, there's a big truck in the driveway full of posters. The man says they're for you. Posters? Is that the man at the back door? No, the egg man's at the back door. Oh, my goodness. Tell the egg man to leave a dozen eggs and tell the other man to take the posters away. Hello? But they're Red Cross posters, Uncle Mort. They're beautiful. I don't care if they're painted by Ted Rosini. Get them out of here. Yes, this is Mr. Gildersleeve. Where should the man take the posters? To Mrs. Pettibone. She sent them here. Oh, tell him to put them in the garage. Okay. Gee. Oh, yes. Hello, Mrs. Edwards. <laughs> yes, indeed. We are giving a, uh, having a meeting tonight at my house. Yeah. 219 Lakeside. Just take the south bus around 8 o'clock, yes. That's fine, Mrs. Edwards. Goodbye. Mrs. Edwards. Well, I don't know who invited her, but she'll have to sit on the floor. Well, hello, Mr. Gillespie. <laughs> what can I do for you this afternoon? Just give me a little peace and quiet, Peavy, and a tuna salad sandwich. Tuna salad, did you read? I thought things had quieted down at your house the last few days. Well, they had. And last night, I got myself mixed up in something new. This is the worst yet, Peavy. A woman's committee. Oh. Mm. Having a meeting at my house tonight. Got every chair I own stuffed into the parlor. There'll be women hanging from the chandeliers. Yeah, I know how that is, Mr. Gildersleeve. We have those things at our house every so often. Oh? Oh? Uh, committee? No, this is purely a social affair. Mrs. Peavy belongs to a reading club, and the ladies take turns meeting at each other's houses, and it works out so that the earthquake hits us about every six months. Uh, earthquake is right, Peavy. But a reading club must be fairly peaceful. Yeah, I wouldn't say that. Last year, they were reading A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, and there was some pretty strong talk. Some liked the ending and some didn't. Some said it was true to life and some said it wasn't. Club had to go back to the Atlantic Monthly for a while to get back on an even keel. Uh, that's nothing, Peavy. That's nothing. Why a committee? Uh, here's your sandwich, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, thanks. 
A committee is far worse than any club could possibly be, Peavy. Uh, were you ever on a committee with a bunch of women? Yes, I've served. What? <laughs> How'd you like it? Mr. Gildersleeve, some of my best customers are women. Stop thinking about your cash register, Peavy. Women are fiends, and you know it. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> it's true, Peavy. Mark my words. We're going to have to fight them before we're through. Well, Mr. Gildersleeve, if there ever was a war to be neutral in, that'll be the one. <laughs> Listen, Peavy, this committee is for the Red Cross, and these women want to kill each other over who gets credit for a $100 donation from the First National Bank. Did you ever hear anything as silly as that? Well, I was on a committee with some men once, air raid wardens, a few years back. I remember they argued one night for two hours about whether we should paint the hose cart red or white. Red is the only color for a hose cart. Mm, and you can't see it at night. Oh, no, don't be silly, Peavy. All fire engines are red. Fact remains, you can see a white hose cart, and you can't see a red one. It's all right. Paint it white. Why, George, you argue just like a woman. Mm, you argue just like an airman wouldn't. What? <laughs> no offense, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yeah. Some of my best customers are air raid wardens. Here, Peavy. Aren't you going to finish your sandwich? No. A little milk to slosh it down with? No, confound it. I come in here looking for a little peace and quiet, and you get me so upset, I can't eat. Talk about the women. <laughs> Ladies, 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 please. <laughs> As your chairman, if I may make a suggestion. Well, I frankly see no reason against it. Mrs. Pettigrew, I can give you a very good reason. Well, if you ask me, I still think we'd do much better with a kitchen boo. Oh, really, Mrs. Ransom, if we've got to go through all that again. Uh, well, no uh, uh, ladies, if I might make a suggestion. If I might make a suggestion. No, I guess not. Drop off, there's someone at the door. Bertie, doorbell. It, been with us a long time. <laughs> Judge Hooker. Hello, Bertie. I thought you was in Chicago, Judge. I'm back. It's Judge Hooker, girl. Well, I can leave out now. Here go. Well, well, ladies, this is a pleasure. I didn't know whether you'd still be in session here or not. Well, welcome home, Judge. Thank you, Gildy. You got here just in time. Ladies, it gives me the greatest pleasure to turn this meeting over to our rightful chairman, Judge Hooker. Oh, no, no, no. Don't let me disturb anything, Gildy. I'll just sit right here. Pray proceed. Oh, but I insist. After all, you're the chairman, Judge. I'm only acting in your absence. Pretend I'm absent. Yeah, but, Judge... Uh, let's get on with the meeting, shall we? Proceed, Gildy. You old goat. Uh, well, where were we? Oh, oh yeah, oh, yeah. I say we ought to have a kitchen booth. Doorbell, Gildy. Bertie! Yes, uh, more interruptions here. Is uh, Mrs. Pettibone here? Yes, sir, she is. Come in. Oh, I'm her son. She asked me to call for her. Oh, my goodness, you're so big. I never even recognized you in your uniform. Oh, Charles, darling, come in and meet the ladies. We are not quite through yet. Uh, you don't mind waiting? Oh, not at all. I'm not going anywhere. Oh, girls, you all know my son. Oh. Uh, Charles is driving me home. Oh, no, no, don't move. Don't get up. I'll sit just over here. Uh. Hello there, Charlie. Oh, hi, Mr. Gillisleeve. Charles, my boy, it's an honor to have you here with us this evening. Well, thank you, Judge. Uh, don't let me interrupt the meeting. Oh, that's all right. The judge has already interrupted it. <laughs> uh, shall we proceed, ladies? Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, Mrs. Ransom? Since Judge Hooker's here, I should like to ask him whether he did or did not tell me that I was to roll bandages in Hogan's window. I've told you, Mrs. Ransom, the judge personally appointed me to represent the Red Cross at Hogan. <laughs> if you don't mind, Mrs. Pettibone, I'd... I'd rather hear it from the judge. Yeah, how about that, Judge? Which of these ladies did you choose for the honor? <clears throat> I am reminded of an old story about the trolley car conductor. <laughs> who, when a lady accosted him... This has nothing to do with any old story, Judge. No, it hasn't. Which of us did you say could sit in Hogan's window? <clears throat> ladies... I find myself in the predicament of Paris when he was called upon to judge who was the fairest of women. Uh, but being of a judicial turn of mind, I lean more to the judgment of Solomon. In brief, I should like to see you both sitting in Hogan's window. The window isn't big enough for both of us. The state isn't big enough for both of us. <laughs> 
Now, ladies, please, no petty jealousy. What's petty about? We're all working for the Red Cross here, you know. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Ah, uh, the chair recognizes Mrs. Pettibone. If I might be permitted to change the subject. Pray do. I should like to ask Miss Goodwin just why the public school started its Red Cross collection a day early. Well, I don't see that it makes much difference. Naturally, we wanted to make a good show. You knew so... very well, Miss Goodwin, the children would collect from their mothers before the women's club could reach them. That's not true. No, You ladies. just wanted to get all the credit. Oh, no, she didn't. Don't no, tell me. I wasn't speaking to you anyway. Uh, uh, ladies. <laughs> ladies, please. This isn't getting us anyplace. Judge, lend me a hand here. <laughs> Don't you just sit there laughing, you old goat? Now, ladies, quiet, please, quiet. Quiet! <laughs> Judge Hooker wants to speak. Uh, thank you, thank you. By way of diversion, ladies, I should like to suggest that we have an honored guest here tonight, young Charlie Pettibone, or I should say, Lieutenant Pettibone. Uh, Sergeant. What's that? <laughs> Sergeant. <laughs> Sergeant Pettibull, I'm sorry. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> anyway, I think it might be nice if Charlie would say a few words to us. Oh, oh no, no, please. I, oh, I... come, Charles. Say something to the lady. Yeah, come on, Charlie. Uh, tell us some of your experience. Yes, yes, oh, oh, gosh, I don't know anything to say. I mean... Tell us what it's like over there. I remember the last war. Of course, I didn't get across myself, but I remember it. <laughs> I'll never forget one time. We were stationed at Camp Upton, and one morning the CO lined us all up. Yeah, there. What? Charlie was going to tell us about his experiences. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, how about it, Charlie? How about those uh, French girls over there? Yeah, how about those mademoiselles? Parlez-vous Francais? Oh, you kid. <laughs> hey, Charlie? <laughs> yeah, come on, Charlie. Tell us all about it, huh? Well, all right. I'll tell you about it. Over where I was, there weren't any French girls. There weren't any girls of any kind, except the army nurses and the girls from the Red Cross. I don't like to say this, and maybe I shouldn't, but coming back here and seeing what's going on, I, I mean, around home and what I've heard here tonight, well, I've seen what the Red Cross does at the front, and I hate to think it gets this kind of a kicking around at home. Charles, if you're talking about us... Now, now wait, wait a minute, Mother. I know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you and, and everybody. I hope you won't get mad. But let me ask you something. You think the Red Cross workers with the Army have got time to worry about who gets the credit or who wears the uniform? They've got a job to do, and they get it done. Now, you're complaining because the school kids got out and collected the dough before you and your committee got moving. Well, I say good for them, because I know the kind of support the Red Cross is giving us in the Army. And I think the Red Cross ought to get the same kind of support here in Somerville, instead of a... A lot of people fighting among themselves and figuring what's in it for them. And, well, if this is the kind of thing that's going on, I'm sorry I came home. I guess I've said enough now. If no one else has anything to say, I move we adjourn. Second the motion. But first, I want to say this. There's going to be another meeting of this committee at my office at 8.30 tomorrow morning. 8.30? 8.30. And any lady who starts any nonsense, I'll punch her right in the nose. <laughs> Well, folks, this was just a little fable. But let's remember, the big thing is for the Red Cross to keep going. They do so many vitally important things for our men that can't be done by anyone else. Their help to the wounded, the prisoners of war, their organization of blood banks, all these services must continue. So when your neighbors come around and ask you for a contribution, remember to be generous. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Music on this program was directed by Claude Sweet. This is Ken Carpenter speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company, makers of Parquet Margin on a complete line of famous quality food products. Kraft invites you to listen again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> this is the National Broadcasting Company.